Happy Sabbath. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, shall we? Father, we thank you that we can meet together here with you today. You have given us the blessing of the Sabbath. You've given us the blessing of this place of worship. And you've given us the blessing of this body of believers to be connected with. And now I pray that as we delve into your word and consider who you are and who we are in relation to you, I just pray that you will strengthen our faith and our resolve to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I have entitled the message, Making Sabbath a Delight. And I have... um, I just want to go over the principles of Sabbath keeping that allow you to enjoy the Sabbath. Because, you know, it should be more than just hard and fast rule, don't you think? I believe that God really wants us to enter into a a rich experience that we actually will enjoy. And so... That's what's going to be the focus of today's message, and uh, we'll be building on some things from from last Sabbath. I, actually, just before I go there, let me say this: last Sabbath, um, it, whether you were here or not, what I what I covered was um, the fact that God, the Sabbath is a memorial of creation; that God is the Creator, and He calls us into a time of worship in the space and time which He has created for us to come apart and rest a while. And we talked about the dangers of the the ditches of mentality for uh, Sabbath keeping, which is legalism and liberalism. And we want to stay out of those ditches. Amen? All right. So, having said that, I want to proceed then with today's message. The first point that I want to make is don't make it a burden. Don't make Sabbath a burden. When, when the Jews <laughs> were running around at, at Jesus' time, when he was walking here among them, it was, there, there was a loaded plate for everybody in terms of rules that they had to observe for the Sabbath. There were so many rules that people weren't thinking about what is it that you know, God has in store for me? They were thinking about, oh, I better make sure I'm not doing this, I, that I am doing that. that I, and their, uh, their minds were occupied with all of the man-made rules that had been placed on Sabbath keeping. And so people were burdened. They were weighed down. And <clears throat> I want to take a look, if you'll just take your Bible. If you brought your Bible today, can you say amen? Amen. Let's take a look at Mark chapter 2. I want to find just a story that alludes to this very kind of thing. Mark chapter 2, and uh, we're going to look at verses 23 through 28. So if you're there, say amen. Amen. All right, then beginning in verse 23, it says, Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? I want to stop right there and ask you, what is it that they are saying is not lawful on the Sabbath? Harvesting, right? Working, right? But he said to them, and look what Jesus says, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the shewbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord 
of the Sabbath. Okay, so I want to get to the main point, I believe, of what Jesus is trying to get here, get to here. And that is, he didn't create the Sabbath and then say, okay, so I got this great place in time. I'm going to create man and then make sure that he does what he's supposed to in the Sabbath. Man wasn't created for the Sabbath. Sabbath was created for man, right? God made a space and time in which he dwells. And he invites man into that space as a blessing. The Sabbath is a gift to you. Sabbath was made for man. He is giving you that special connection time to come apart from all the things that normally occupy you and weigh you down and burden you and all of your work and toil and to come apart and rest a while with him in his very presence. It's a gift to you. That's wonderful, right? So now I want to talk about the idea of judging others. You see, these, these Pharisees, they were finding fault, weren't they? They were looking at what other people were doing, and, and you know, they pretty much kind of had that mentality. Ha, ah, gotcha. <laughs> Caught you breaking the Sabbath. Right? And I'm just saying that, you know, we need to be careful that we don't develop that kind of mindset too. Really. Seriously, we need to not be looking down. With those two ditches I was talking about, legalism and liberalism, it tends to be people who are more legalistic that are focusing on somebody else that's not doing what they're supposed to. Not keeping the rule. And I'm just going to say this real plain. Sometimes Sabbath keeping looks different. Actually, it always looks different in one person's life than another person's life. Let me say this. There are commands. Commands, the command to keep the Sabbath holy, that's unchangeable, right? You don't mess with that. God said it, that's what he meant. And that's what it is. Where people start to tinker and tamper and get involved in other people's business is when they start trying to put in these other rules on top of that. So this is, these are the things that you can do and these are the things that you can't do. And, and they start to impose their own personal values or convictions upon others. I know it's a little muddy here, right? But I'm telling you this. You need to live by the principle not get caught up in a ton of rules. The principle is keeping the Sabbath holy. Do those things which enable you to stay connected with God in his presence and show regard for him in that day. What falls into that category? A ton of stuff. So, I want to point out... Some of you have heard me tell this story. Bear with me. One time when I was very young, in, in my experience with being a Seventh-day Adventist, um, my kids were little. Um, I think they were about three and seven. And, uh, you know, my, my family and I, we went out after church on a hot summer day in Michigan, and we went out to a park. And we drove all the way to the end of the park, which is miles back in it. And there at the very end, they had this secluded lake. And it was beautiful. Very natural setting. And there was a huge oak tree. And there was a Pine, uh, excuse me, some picnic tables underneath the oak tree. And we sat up there and had our picnic with this group of people that we went with. And so 
we're having our lunch and everything. And, you know, as kids often do, they finished first. And they gravitated kind of naturally toward the water. And as they gravitated toward the water, as I said, it was a hot summer day. My boys were in shorts. And they started to go out into the water. Wading out into the water. Splashing around a bit. And one of the ladies who was sitting across from me at the picnic table said, Oh, look at those kids. They're in the water. And it's the Sabbath. And I went, Oh, you're right. And I rushed down to the water side and got in the water with them. I called them over to me. We were standing by, there were these lily pads, and there's a whole group of lily pads. And I called my boys over and I squatted down like this. And I put one boy on each knee. And the water was coming up like about around here, you know. And it was so clear. And you could see the fish swimming right up, right up by us. Just right up in front of us. And the boys were grabbing onto the fish and the fish would squirm out of their hand. It was such a cool experience. Such a great encounter as I talked to the boys about God's creation with the beauty of, that he makes and here we are having this really awesome encounter with nature as i'm teaching them about god's creation and the woman up at the picnic table is judging us for being in the water you know what i'm saying so what i'm really trying to get at is don't impose your stuff on others and make it a burden for other people because she, you know, because she didn't, you know, feel like it was right for her to go get in the water, I didn't have a problem with that. It's okay that you don't think so. Now, don't take me wrong. I believe that we should only engage in those activities that draw our attention to God, to His creation, that let us interact with His people and stuff like that. There's there's principles. It's when you start trying to dictate all the rules. That's what got all the Jews burdened down by people imposing all those specific rules so they had to remember hundreds of them. And it sucked all the joy out of Sabbath. Do you understand what I'm talking about? All right. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, <clears throat> I'm going to read just verses 2 and 3. Beginning in verse 2, it says, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. By this we know that we love what? The children of God. It's not that we know we love God, it says that we know we love the children of God, Right? When we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. So check it out. It, it's wrong for us to be looking at the commandments as this set of rules. That we don't allow love to be in our character. And then we just, just get judging about people who aren't keeping the rules. That's wrong friends, right? Are we to keep his commands? Absolutely. Yes, we are. But we are to be loving the children of God. And, and when we love God and we keep his commandments, that helps us to love other people and not to cast judgment upon them. It's, it's amazing. It, it says, if, if we keep his commands, uh, excuse me, it says this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So listen, we should be looking at this two ways. Number one, just my own attitude about it. God's commandments are not burdensome. When I think about the Sabbath, 
if I think about it right, he's trying to give me a blessing and a gift, right? It's not a burden. Oh, man, it's the Sabbath. So I got to keep my own attitude in check, right? But secondly, what about making it burdensome for somebody else because you're trying to, you know, keep your watch on them, make sure they're not doing it wrong. Now listen, I'm not saying turn a blind eye to sin. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you make other people feel like they're living in a police state when it's supposed to be Sabbath. You get the difference, right? Okay. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 58, let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 58. It's a great principle here for us to live by. When you're there, could you just please say amen? amen. All right, Isaiah 58. I'm going to begin reading in verse 13. I'll read verses 13 and 14, and it reads this way. If you turn your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, what I'd like to do today is just kind of unpack this verse and look at what it's talking about, what it really means. It says, if you turn your foot, turn away your foot from the Sabbath. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath. In other words, <laughs> he's actually talking about turning away from doing your pleasure. If he, he's talking about if you're not walking in the way that God is calling you to walk on the Sabbath. If you turn away your foot, it looks like rebellion, friends, if you're not walking in the way that God is calling you to. Let's look at Psalm 85. Turn there. Psalm 85, and when you're there, please say amen. One more time if you're there. Okay, very good. Psalm 85, we're going to read verses 8 through 13. It says here, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back. Let them not do what? Turn back to what? Folly or foolishness. Turning back to folly or foolishness is turning away from God's ways and turning back to our own. Okay? Let them not turn back to folly. And verse 9. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. I want to pause just for a moment to talk about this righteousness and peace have kissed. Too often, mercy and righteousness have been talked about as two totally separate kinds of deals. But friends, they work together in the way that God does things. Both mercy and righteousness God forgives us our sins and we are guilty, right? There you have mercy. But then he calls us to newness of life and obedience, right? And there we have righteousness. Jesus is the personification of mercy and righteousness kissing. He has come to die in our place, showing mercy for us. And yet he lived sinlessly. Not once did he falter. He upheld the law. He fulfilled it in every aspect, right? And so God is calling us 
to experience this thing of mercy and righteousness. We are forgiven and we're to live in obedience. In verse 11 it says, then, uh, excuse me, truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Now check this out in verse 13. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. His footsteps will be our pathway. Christ is our example in how many things? All things. And, and we learn how to walk righteously as we follow him. And his footsteps become our pathway, the ground we tread. And, and brothers and sisters, this is what we have to do as we continue to walk with God, turning our foot away from defilement and into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Okay, now let us look to 2 Timothy because the next thing that is pointed out in Isaiah chapter 58 was that we are to keep, you know, turn our foot from doing our own pleasure. This is not how we keep the Sabbath holy. We don't keep it by doing our own pleasure. So let's look at 2 Timothy. When you're there, say amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Going to read verses 1 through 5. Now listen, I realize this is a description of people in the last days. So why am I reading it? Because we're people in the last days. All right? So it says in verse 1, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, and check out this one, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. So he is saying that we should turn away our foot from doing our own pleasure on the Sabbath. And in this group of people that is listed as, you know, the, the bad traits, the bad characteristics of society in the last days, the people who are condemned, it lists lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, right? What does lover of pleasure look like? Does that, hold on, does that mean you can't have fun on Sabbath? Does that mean you shouldn't enjoy yourself on the Sabbath? No, it does not. What it does mean is there's a difference in my pursuing my own designs on pleasure or my pursuing God's pleasure for my life. There's a big difference. And I'm going to tell you something, I am so short-sighted in my own pursuits of pleasure. It is so rich when I realize I have entered into God's designs for pleasure in my experience. So much better than anything I can dream up for my own self. And yet, we get so little. And so often, people start coming toward the Sabbath like, oh man, it's Sabbath again. And it's getting to be summertime. It's going to be long. <laughs> or, or, or they think, you know, eh, okay, church is over. We got fellowship meal and then like about five hours before sunset. And then after sunsets, we can do whatever it is. I know I'm kind of acting it out a little bit and emphasizing, but that's not unrealistic, is it? And yet, I, I got to say that we are missing it. We are so missing 
what God has in store for us. The Sabbath is a gift in which he is inviting us to come and experience what it is like to be in his presence and meditate upon his word, experience the wonder of his creation, dwell in true unity and fellowship with his people. He has blessings that we forfeit for the pursuit of our whims and our lusts. Sad commentary, right? But you know I'm speaking the truth. And so he's telling us, he's actually warning us, turn away from doing your own pleasure on the Sabbath. Because you, it's, (laughs) and don't look at God like, like he's like the Pharisees who were trying to catch the disciples doing something wrong. God's not like looking at you, oh, ha, caught you. You're busted. No, he's actually yearning. <laughs> Would you give up all that I'm offering it's to pursue that? Come on, son. Come on, daughter. I have so much more for you than that. You're going to pursue your own stuff until you get caught up in the bondage of your sin and then you're stuck. He says, though, I'm going to go back to Isaiah 58 real quick. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own, your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight. Call the Sabbath a delight. What's a delight? It's a joy. That's right. It's something that is a great pleasure. You, you really enjoy it, right? If it's a delight. He says that we should call the Sabbath a delight. When's the last time you felt like that? Man, I can't. It's preparation day. Sabbath is tomorrow. Uh, And, you know, listen, I want to tell you this. Somebody was telling me about uh, their experience when they were in Israel. And, you know, uh, a lot. Israel is very secularized and everything now. And but yet there's this still this emphasis on Sabbath. And these these people were. Adventists that went over and started experiencing some things about the way some of the Jews uh, there were keeping Sabbath. And the biggest thing that they noticed about the difference in the way in the United States we keep Sabbath versus the way they keep it in Israel, the biggest thing they noticed was in Israel, it was a celebration. And they couldn't wait for it to start and they didn't want it to end. Interesting, right? So, look with me to Psalm 1. When you're there, say amen. All right, Psalm 1. I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2 here. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But notice this. His delight, his what? His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And and we're instructed that we should call the Sabbath a delight, right? And it is the law. And you know, if you read much of Psalms, you find David over and over talking about how wonderful God's law is, how he loves his law, how it's such a beautiful and marvelous thing. You see, friends, if you're anything like me when you were younger especially, and maybe it flows into now, I don't know. But when, you, when I was younger... I used to look at God's law as a list of 
do's and don'ts. Rules that kept me from things I wanted to do. And it wasn't until later that I discovered that God's law wasn't there to keep me away from good things. It was actually there to keep me away from bad things. That God was trying to put a parameter around my life and say, if you'll stay within these guidelines, you can experience my love and my blessing on an ongoing basis. But when you step outside those guidelines, it's there that you find destruction and death and pain and loss and sorrow and misery and grief. And I'm trying to protect you from all of that. So stay in my covenant. And I'll give you life and life more abundantly. And now that I, I realize that, I look at God's commandments so differently as, as this protection that God builds into my life to keep me inside of loving, honorable relationships with Him and others. Make sense? So, the last part, well, uh, of this slide here says, the holy day of the Lord honorable. Making the holy day of the Lord honorable. Now let's look to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. If you're there, could you say amen? All right. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And beginning in verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have what? Pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. He has made wonderful works to be what? Remembered. Okay, so check it out. There's some key words in here. It talks about the works of God. And, we, and Sabbath is a memorial of his what? His works, his creative works. And it's actually, it even says here in, uh, let's see, what was it? Verse 4 was it, I think? Um, yeah, he has made his wonderful works to be remembered. And he, then he builds it into the commandments, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so he wants you to consider his amazing works. Ha have you done that lately? Ha have you just taken the time to consider what God does? You know, the other day I was out at um, uh, George Washington Carver Monument. And I was sitting by the pond. I took my lawn chair. And I hiked out there and I sat by the pond. And I just watched for a while. I saw all the turtles lining up on the log, getting their sun. And I thought, man, turtles are so cool, right? Saw some little furry critter coming bloop, right into the pond and then you don't see him. <laughs> so I was just having this experience in nature. And I see this hummingbird come by have you considered a hummingbird i mean these guys how fast do their wings flutter and they can hold still go forward backward you know it's amazing and they it's just when you consider god's marvelous creation the wonder of the created thing is something but then you think about the one who is the designer and you just say wow what an amazing God I serve now going back to um, Isaiah before I read that just want to continue on with that. It says, uh, 
if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him. What does that mean, honor? Showing respect. Yes. And that is accomplished. I heard somebody else say obey. Obeying is showing respect, isn't it? So it says that we shall honor him. If, if we shall turn away our foot from doing our own pleasure and call the Sabbath a delight, holy day of the Lord honorable. In other words, by the way, that holy day of the Lord being honorable means it's worthy of respect, right? Why is it worthy of respect? Some people don't respect the day. They act like, well, you can keep any day. It doesn't matter which day you keep as long as you keep a day. But God's word says that there is a day to keep. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, right? And it, what does it mean to keep it honorable? We, we should show respect to that day because the one who actually hallowed it and sanctified it. Right? And now we talk about honoring him, our creator. He's worthy of respect. He's worthy of our honor, our obedience, our worship. He's worthy, right? Let's look at Psalm 96. Psalm 96. And I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. If you're there, could you say amen, please? Beginning in verse 4. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. He is worthy of all the honor that we can show him. Amen? All right. Now, it also says in Isaiah 58 there <clears throat> that we should not do our own ways. Now, we're talking about the Sabbath in specific here. Not doing our own ways. And, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if you know exactly what God is talking about here, but... God is trying to call you into doing his ways. It's not just that you stop doing bad things or something. God's trying to call you away from your ways and into his ways. Okay, so let's look at Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, if you're there, just say amen. We're doing a lot of looking up of scripture today, aren't we? That's, that's good for us. It's good exercise. Proverbs chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 21 through 23. And notice in 21 it says, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. What does this mean? I'm going to read it again. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. What does that mean? The Lord is watching us. All things are naked and exposed to him with whom we have to do, right? He's not wondering what you're up to. He sees what you're up to. Right? But he's not watching you so he can crush you. But he does know everything that you're engaged with. He sees all your ways, your comings and your goings, the things that occupy your mind and your conversations, the way your relationships are unfolding, the activities you're engaging in, the things that you do and the things that you don't do. He knows it all. And he is wanting you to enter into his ways because look what happens with your ways. In verse 22, it says, His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Listen, if God leaves us to our own way, we are surely hopelessly doomed. 
But he isn't leaving us to our own way. He's trying to get our attention and call us to his way. And he's warning us, don't pursue, you know, uh, proceed in your own ways or you're going to get into big trouble. My ways are the ways of life, right? All right, so now uh, let's take a look at Psalm 81. Psalm 81, I want to read verses 11 through 13. <clears throat> when you're there, if you could say amen, please. All right. Now, you know I'm only doing that because I want to make sure you're keeping on track with me and that you're getting it from the Lord. Okay? From his word. Psalm 81, verses 11 through 13. Check this out, you guys. It says, But my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. My people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. Do you see the heart of God here? He's he's yearning for his people to turn back to him. But, you know, he is a gentleman. He's calling and he's commanding. But he lets you make the choice. And he says, I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. That's people go in their own ways. But that's not what he wants. He says, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. By the way, we're not just talking about the nation of Israel right now. What are we talking about? We're talking about God's chosen people, right? We are all Israel. If we're born of faith, isn't that right? So it says to not do our own ways and not finding our own pleasure. There's that thing of finding our own pleasure again, you know. So does that mean, I mean, how do you process this? Do you get feeling like, well, then you can't have any fun? Can't do anything you want to do? You can have fun, can't you? You can enjoy God. See, that's the thing. It's not just about enjoying yourself. It's about enjoying God. And you know, look at Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 11. I just love this verse because it it really cuts to the chase on people. A lot of times people think if they're going to have what God wants for them, then somehow they're going to miss out on all this great stuff they could get for themselves. But Psalm 16, 11 says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So when you pursue God, when you make your connection with Him the priority, that's really pursuing pleasure because He's the one who really holds pleasure. Right? I mean real pleasure. Not this fleeting stuff where you have, you know, some kind of enjoyment for a minute and then it's gone. We're talking about pleasures how long? Forevermore. Forevermore. They lie with God, friends. And he's trying to give them to us. It also says, nor speaking your own words. And this one really hits home. You know, it's, you know, let me just ask this question. Where do your words come from? 
Give me a scriptural answer. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when I'm sitting there saying, man, when's he going to quit preaching? I'm so hungry. <laughs> Where's my heart? It's, it's, it's on my stomach, that's for sure. I'm thinking about what I want to, how I want to satisfy my appetite or something. Now, I'm not talking about somebody who's got diabetes and needs to eat or something. So don't take that offensively if anybody's in that situation. You get my point, right? Okay. So not speaking our own words. And it's, it's how should our conversations look? What, what kind of guidelines should they have, you know? Here's the thing. If your conversation takes your mind and somebody else's mind off from God, it's not the right conversation for Sabbath. If your conversation is somehow embracing God and His creation, His people, His plan, His kingdom, His word, His promises the many splendors of the theme of salvation, the stories of the great patriarchs that went before us, the, you know, the miracles of Jesus. If your conversation is embracing some things about God, then it's on target. Speaking our own words is, is trouble, friends. But God gives us some principles. In Psalm 19, verse 14, Psalm 19, verse 14, can you say amen when you get there? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I want to ask you this. When is the last time you prayed a prayer like that? And I just want to ask you, will you take the opportunity to pray a prayer like that? This Sabbath day, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What a wonderful thing to pray. Amen? We need our hearts and minds stayed upon him so that we can speak in ways that, are, that impart grace to the hearers. Look at Psalm 141 with me. Psalm 141. And I'm going to read verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Have you ever, have you ever said something before and you wish the moment it came out of your mouth, you wish you hadn't said it? but it like escaped like a flock of doves and it's just gone to do its thing, right? So ask God to set a guard over your mouth so that you will only speak when your silence is, when your words are more golden than your silence. I know, these are lofty ideas. But they're not just ideas. These are things God is telling us to do in his word. And remember that God's biddings are his enablings. If he tells you to do something, he intends to empower you to do that which he's told you to do. Now, we're getting close to wrapping up here.
I'm going to look back at Isaiah 58. I want to read through this again. It says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then, notice this is a if-then, a conditional promise, right? Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. Delight again means what? Joy, pleasure, enjoyment. And look at Psalm 37, 4. This is pretty awesome, you guys. Psalm 37, if you're there, say amen. All right, look at verse 4. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Listen, everybody wants something. Everybody has some basic needs. And listen, I can tell you, everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be understood. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to have purpose and meaning and direction and fulfillment and community and unity and healing and blessing in their lives. Everyone to a person. And God has them all. God has all that. He will give you the desires of your heart. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 57 with me. Isaiah chapter 57. <clears throat> I want to look at verse 15. Because in Isaiah 58, it says that when, we'll, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, we will ride on the high hills of the earth. So now we're looking at Isaiah 57, verse 15, and it says, For thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell, where? In the high and holy place. Notice, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones, Listen, God is trying to say to you that he will cause you, when, when you make him your delight, and you humble yourself in his sight, and you follow his commands, and you yield to his lordship, he will lift you up. And not only will he lift you up, you'll be dwelling where he dwells. He will be with you as you're the humble one submitting to him, and he will revive you and refresh you in your experience. I think that's awesome. Look with me to the next thing. It says that you're going to be fed with the heritage of Jacob. I'll, I'll, re I'll read it again. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So let's deal with this feed with the heritage of Jacob. Look now to Isaiah 54 in verse 17. Isaiah 54, if you're there, say amen. Verse 17, check this out. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Listen, God is trying to tell you that he is going to give you a heritage in which you can't be condemned, in which you're not going to be destroyed. He is your deliverer, and he is the one who will establish, establish you for all time. Now let's look to Genesis, and we're actually going to look at something that was said to Jacob about his inheritance, his heritage, okay? Genesis chapter 28, when you're there, say amen. All right, Genesis 28, we're going to read verses 3 and 4. Beginning in verse 3, it says, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessings of Abraham to you and your descendants with you. 
that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Listen, God gave Abraham a country, a promised land, right? But remember that we're talking about a heavenly country, right? Friends, we're talking about a heavenly country. And God is promising that as we connect with him in this covenant, there is so much to it. As we're yielding ourselves and we're entering into this communion with him, he is trying to bring about exactly this. I'm going to lift you up because you have humbled yourself before me. I'll bring you into times of refreshing. I'm going to revive your spirit. And then I'm going to bring you into the land that I promised to Abraham. Because you are my people. And I am your God. Friends, I want to finish with this idea. I hear people talking about the Sabbath this way, and I've been guilty of it a lot in, in the past. Well, on Sabbath I can't, or I don't get to. That started out a lot of my statements. I can't, or I don't get to. And I want to challenge you this Sabbath and this week to have a new dialogue, even if it's in your mind, to begin a new dialogue that sounds like this. On Sabbath, I get to. What? I get to come and worship God. I get to hear from the living word of God that is able to make me wise for salvation. I get to look at creation and consider and relate with the one who actually created it. I get to be with God's chosen people and be a part of the movement that is preparing this world for the soon return of Jesus. I get to what? I get to experience healing as I come into the presence of God and don't let anything else interfere with that. How many things could you tag on to that? I get to. Please, let me ask you. Will you try to give this some thought and meditation this week? If you will, will you just raise your hand in a commitment to do so? Thank you. Praise God. Let's have our our closing hymn, and then we'll close with prayer. Okay? Um, It is number 90... 93, number 93. Let's all stand as we sing. All things bright and beautiful, page 93.
Brothers and sisters, we should heed the commandment, not just because it's a rule. We should heed the commandment because God is trying to make it a delight for us. God wants us to be delighted by encountering him. And you know what? When you encounter the living God, it is a delightful thing. Shall we pray? Father, we are a people in need of your forgiveness. We have been hard-headed and hard-hearted in many ways. We ask, Lord, that you will forgive us for our rebellion, that you will forgive us for our selfishness and narrow-mindedness, our vain pursuits. I pray, Father, that you will help us to fix our eyes upon you, that as we meditate upon your law, we will discover the wonders of who you are and what it is that you're trying to draw us into, this beautiful and delightful relationship. Oh, Lord, establish us as your people. You are a wonderful God. Help us not to miss it because we're caught up with our own ways. Lord, heal us. And restore us, I pray in Jesus' name.